Good morning. Decided up, I'd upload some Latin instruction today. Today we're going to be talking about the cases, the Latin case structure. Um, cases are linked inseparably to the idea of uh, function. So case and function, I very often say those two together, case and function. Because the parallel concept in English is the function of each word in a sentence. Now in English we typically, uh, through, through, through the means of word order and through the means of preposition, uh, we typically express what Latin expresses through the case system. Now cases function like this, that the very ending of a word will change based on its case. The stem of that word will not change typically. So, I won't give you the morphology of the cases, but I'm going to give you the function of the cases. I always start with the function, because there's no point in knowing what something looks like until you know what it does. Because identifying it as nominative, genitive, dative, etc., uh, that does you very little good unless you know what to do with it. So you need to be able to learn how to translate Latin case structure into English sentence structure which means uh, knowing what is a subject, what is a direct object, what's an indirect object, what prepositions to use in front of what, so on and so forth. So I have to move quickly. My video, um, the, the, the space left on my device won't allow for more than about 12 or 13 minutes of video. So very quickly, the nominative is the subject of the sentence. Colloquially, we call it a the doer, the doer of the verb. So the subject is the doer of the verb, that is the nominative. When you find the nominative in Latin, no matter where you find it in a Latin sentence, as you translate it into English, the nominative needs to go first, before the verb. So the, the dog bites the boy. Dog has to be before the word bites for it to be understood properly. Nominative is the subject, also the doer. <clears throat> In English, it goes before the verb. All right, genitive. Genitive shows a couple of things. Primarily, it shows possession. You use the preposition of to translate the genitive nearly always. Genitive shows possession, you use the preposition of. Sometimes it's a genitive of description. So the woman of great wisdom, the man of great strength. Still you're going to translate it with an of, and still you can conceive of it as possession, because the man possesses the strength, the woman possesses the wisdom. So I wouldn't get hung up on that. Dative. Dative is the equivalent in English of the indirect object. You translate it using to or for. To or for. I gave a lot of money for charity. The boy gave the flower to the girl. Um, you know, I, 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 um, I volunteered, I volunteered 10 hours for the soup kitchen. You know, all of these, all of these are indirect objects. And in English, we don't have a means, we don't have a regular means of expressing that. Um, except by swapping the place of the direct object and the indirect object. So you could say, I gave the girl a flower. Or you can say, I gave a flower to the girl. So there's two ways of doing it. There's two ways of doing it in English. Either by word order, in which the indirect object uh, swaps places with the direct object just after the verb, or you use a preposition two or four. English is far more dependent on preposition than word order. Then you have the accusative. This is the equivalent of the English direct object. Typically, it just comes after the verb. 
So the boy kicks the can. The can is the direct object. Um, you could simply say that, well, I, I, won't, I won't give any instruction here. There's not enough space. In a normal English translation, the accusative will fall just after the verb. And so the sentence structure for English is uh, subject, verb, direct object. That's, that's the standard construct. Subject, verb, direct object. If you keep that system, if you keep that in the forefront of your mind, and that's how you conduct your translations, other things, other things, like prepositional phrases, um, ablatives of time, they will fit wherever they sound good, but you need to keep in mind it's going to be subject, verb, direct object for your English. Now, ablative, this is a wild card because ablative, oh, we, we call this a couple of things. I say very often this shows means or manner. Means, he strikes the nail with a hammer. That's the means. Manner, he struck the nail in anger. Or, he punched the door in anger. That's the manner. Both of those would be in the ablative. It's also, the ablative also functions a lot of times as the object of preposition. Now, this is tricky because oftentimes with the ablative, there does not need to be a, a preposition uh, present in the Latin. It's an assumed preposition. It's an assumed preposition. And when you translate these, you translate them typically with the preposition, and you just stick them where they sound good. So you could, you could say, with a hammer I struck the nail, or you could say, I struck the nail with a hammer. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference to the meaning of the sentence. It's just a matter of what sounds, what sounds better, what sounds more colloquial versus more poetic. Uh, you could even begin to sound like Yoda if you're not careful. But ablative shows means or manner. Um, I would say secondarily, it's the it's the case of case of preposition. But again, preposition will not always be present. Sometimes it's an assumed preposition, and typically you'll try a couple. You'll try with, by, from, or in. With, by, from, or in. Ninety nine percent of all cases that will cover. Uh, what is attempting to be translated, what is attempting to be expressed by the writer. Then you have the vocative. Vocative is almost never uh, morphologically different than nominative. That is, the cases began to collapse at some point before recorded history. And by the time we get written Latin, uh, nominative and vocative have almost collapsed into one another so that they're not morphologically different. Now, before then, the locative and the, and the genitive had more or less collapsed into one another. And then the instrumental and the ablative had already collapsed. The nominative and the vocative were in the process of collapsing into one another morphologically. That is, you cannot tell by looking at the word uh, what it is. The only time the vocative differs in its morphology is in the masculine singular of the U.S. and the I-U-S ending. So, if you wanted to say in the vocative, servus, you would say serve in the vocative. That's slave. So, you know, the, the slave uh, plows the field would appear differently than, hey, you slave. It would appear differently because the vocative is the case of the direct address. So if you call somebody directly by name or title, it'll go into the vocative. Now, it's not necessarily important to know this, and so some curriculums downplay the vocative. The only time it really matters uh, <clears throat> morphologically, as I said, is when it's in the masculine uh, vocative singular with the ending of U.S. or I.U.S. So, like Julius, as in Julius Caesar, would not be Julius in the vocative, it would be Yuli. Uh, servus, as in slave, in the vocative would be serve. So you will knock off the ending and add either an E or retain an I. So that's neither here nor there. Um, direct address is signified oftentimes by being prefixed by an O, as in the English O. 
Oh, Fortuna. Oh, Danny boy. Uh, when you say O oh, before a name or title, like, oh, captain, my captain, that's the vocative in English. That's how you will typically uh, express it in English if you want to be very explicit. If you don't want to be so explicit, the, the context gives it away. I'd say that's true in Latin as well. Oftentimes you end up with what looks like an extra nominative. Uh, it's very possible that that is a vocative. So uh, be careful if you end up with extra nominatives floating around. It's, it's a good chance it's going to be a vocative. Although vocatives are very often in Latin set off by one of these, uh, you could say, uh, preparatory preparatory statements like O. Oh. All right, that is the case structure in Latin. That is the function of each of the cases in Latin. And if you know what these functions are in relationship to the titles, then when we, when we begin to give forms, morphological forms, to each of these, nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, ablative, vocative, you can begin to associate morphological forms with function. And the problem with most Latin instruction is that you learn the morphological forms, but you do not learn the function. It is not expressly taught, typically. Um, Wheelix Latin does a good job of teaching that expressly, but it's in like the first or second chapter. And unless you were paying really close attention at the beginning of, the, of, of your studies, you know, by the middle of your studies, you probably have forgotten this. So this is good review, possibly a good introduction to whoever wants to know. Um, I can keep these coming if it's helpful to anyone. If you all like this material, I can keep these coming. I can jump into the morphology of the five declensions. We can talk about conjugation, verbal mood, tenses. We can talk about all that. That's my bread and butter. Um, if you do like it, let me know.